So I'm just going to say that, I'm going to say out loud what everyone else is thinking. I clearly don't have the, uh, the cuteness content going for me here, but that's okay. That's okay. Let's just have a word of prayer before we continue. Our gracious Lord, as we just reminded again of this wonderful story, this wonderful reality that we have in life, and as our, our kids have just so wonderfully expressed, Lord, this was such a momentous moment in history a moment that continues to touch us in the midst of all of life. And Lord God, today we acknowledge that so often Christmas is one of those busy times, one of those times when our focus can be put on so many other things, good things. But Lord, we ask that even the good things in life would not take us away from you, the ultimate. So Lord, as we turn again to the words that you have given to us, may your Holy Spirit guide us and direct us as we can just experience your presence in life here this day. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today we're into the second week of our mini Christmas series called AKA, as we're looking at Jesus also known as. And the real kind of theme passage that we are going to be looking at over the next, well, last week, this week, and then the next week, is this promise that was given hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. And it was the words that was given first to the prophet Isaiah. A reminder that so often the prophecies that are given to us in the Old Testament had ultimately an immediate fulfillment in the time in which it was given, but also oftentimes a greater fulfillment, a, a, a sense of there is more yet to come. And this promise that God gives to the prophet of Isaiah in chapter 9 is exactly one of these promises. As I, Israel was going through a tremendously difficult time, there was a sense of darkness in their lives, and God is saying, I am going to bring light. I am going to produce hope in the midst of difficulty and in the midst of darkness. And there's these wonderful words that are given. Perhaps you're familiar with them, you've, you've seen them on a Christmas card, we, we sing them in hymns, but it's the wonderful words where it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's what we celebrate in our lives, not only at Christmas, but hopefully in the midst of every day, this this wonderful reality of all that Jesus brings into our life. So last week we looked at how Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who who ultimately restores relationships, not only our our relationship with God, but also the ability to restore our relationships with one another. As we continue to just remember all that that Christ gives to us. So this morning we're going to turn to another name that is given to Jesus. And that is Wonderful Counselor. One of the great gifts that we have in Jesus is that he is the one who is offering to live all of life with us. That he is the one who is going to guide us. He he is the one who is going to direct us. I think at times we we may do ourselves a, a bit of a disservice when we think that Jesus was simply born into this world just so that so that our eternal reality could be redeemed. That's of course a huge part. But when we simply focus on heaven and and on what happens after we die and on the importance of getting right with God for those reasons, what we miss out is this wonderful gift, this wonderful reality where, where God is saying, listen, through Jesus, through my Son, I want to live life with you. I want to give you this this abundant life, this life worth living right now. Whatever your past has been, whatever your future may be, Jesus says, I want to enter into life. I want to enter into this reality. And that's why we celebrate the fact that Jesus is our wonderful counselor. I, I mean, it only makes sense when you, when you read through the biographies of Jesus. When, 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 when he calls those people to him, he doesn't first sit them down and say, okay, listen, we're going to have a little crash course on, on who God is and, and what God was, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about my divinity. And as soon as you can affirm these important realities of who I am, then you're kind of in. No, no Jesus says, you know what? Come, come and follow me. 
And what Jesus so often does is, is he interrupts people in the midst of life. I mean, his first disciples were, were fishing. They were, they were carrying on in the midst of life. And Jesus calls up to them and says, listen, come, come, and, come and follow me. And I don't know what the conversations must have been like, but maybe they're thinking, well, you, like right, right now, Jesus? You mean you want to be a part of my life right now? And, and Jesus is like, yeah. Come and discover what all of life can be with me. So what we always want to do is to begin to unpack what this begins to look like. That, that being a follower of Jesus is, is, is more than just simply agreeing to some doctrinal statements. It is so much more than, than just simply coming and hanging out with like-minded people on a Sunday morning around 1030. It's a reality of all of life. And that's what I really take when Jesus says, I want to be your counselor. I want to be your guide. I want to be the one who directs you in the midst of everything. So there are so many things that we could focus on in terms of, of how Jesus guides us and in terms of how Jesus directs us. But I wanted to focus on one particular aspect of life that I believe touches us regardless of who we are, regardless of where we are. And maybe it's a, it's a reality for you here this morning that, that that is larger than it may be in other times, but it's this aspect of how Jesus can enter into our lives here this day. And to kind of set the table a little bit, um, I want to play a little word association with you. We've done this in the past. I'm going to tweak it a little bit. And what I want you to do is just kind of clear your mind as quickly as you can. And I'm going to say a word, and I want you to say the opposite of that word. Okay? So the first thing that comes to mind, I'm going to throw a word out, and you tell me the opposite of that word. Are you with me? Minds are clear? All right. We'll start off easy and say it loud so there's no like mumbling, right? Let, let, let's, let other people actually hear what you're thinking, okay? First word, hot. 100%. There you go. And remember, remember, I always remember my teachers used to tell me this. There's no wrong answer, okay? There's no wrong answer. So, so be confident. Okay, second one, day. Very good, very good. Wow, you're a bright bunch. Young. Wow. Truth. Excellent. Wow. Winning. Actually, that's a wrong answer. The right answer is the opposite of winning is Toronto Maple Leafs. (laughs) Those of you that know me know where my heart is at, and I promised all the way back in the spring not to take any more shots until the fall. And we're almost in a Christmas now. So anyway, sorry. Last one. Joy. A little bit of difference. We hear sorrow. We hear sadness. But we're all kind of falling into the same reality. But as I started to think about what what is the opposite of joy for me? This, this third Sunday in Advent where we, where we focus in on the reality of how Jesus brings joy and, and asking, well, well, how does Jesus as our guide, as our wonderful counselor, bring joy into the midst of life? I started to ask myself the question, well, what, what exactly is joy? Is it more than sorrow? Is it more than sadness? And what I started to find myself realizing is so often in the Bible, we see people who speak of a tremendous joy in the midst of life, even though it seems as if the circumstances would dictate that of sorrow and sadness. And I start to realize that maybe joy is is more than happiness. It is more than sorrow. It is more than sadness. It is more than the circumstances that we face. That when we celebrate the reality of joy, we we begin to recognize that God wants to step outside of just simply what the circumstances are and to step into our lives and understanding that I believe joy is this confidence, this assurance that no matter what else is going on in the midst of life, God says, I am there with you. I am at work. I am in control. Because if it's, if, if it's not that, then when I begin to read the stories in the Bible, I think, well, well the, the, their circumstance don't seem to lend itself to simply allowing situational, emotional 
response. So as I start to frame it in that sense, one of the things that I begin to see, the opposite of joy, if, if joy is God's assurance of his presence with us, that he is at work, then for me, the opposite of joy becomes that of worry. Do you ever find yourself in a place where the circumstances have gone a way that you could never have possibly imagined or hope? And suddenly worry begins to creep in. And worry brings a sense of fear, the sense of unknown, the sense of wondering, well, now what is going to happen? Wondering, God, are you there? God, are you at work? God, God, is everything going to be okay? Whether big or small, in my life, in my experience, it seems that the greatest thing that robs me of joy is not sorrow, not sadness, but rather that of worry. And so this morning, we just want to simply pause and to, and to look again into the teachings of Jesus to see, well, how did Jesus address this issue? Because one of the things I love so much about what Jesus does is he so often tries to reframe, tries to, tries to redirect what it is that we are experiencing in life. And, and Jesus doesn't say, listen, come and follow me, and suddenly your, your, your life will be filled, of, filled with joy because there'll be no more problems, there'll be no more difficulties, there'll be no more hardships. I, I, I mean... I haven't had that experience, and I'm sure many of you have not either. But rather what Jesus does say is, listen, come and follow me. Let me guide you. Let me direct you so that even in the difficult places of life, you can still find joy because you can be aware of my presence being with you. So this morning, I'm just going to invite Jill to come up and just turn to, again, a, a core teaching of Jesus as he lays out this reality, this, this, this understanding of how we can have joy even in the midst of difficulty. Our scripture is Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of those. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of the Lord. What we see very early on in Jesus' ministry as, he, as he's sitting down with his followers is, is he's speaking through some of the, the great realities of life. Jesus understanding that that, that worry is, is one of those things that, that often crops up on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's in the small things, whether it's in the big things, whether it's in the seemingly unimportant things or those incredibly important things. Jesus is saying there is another way. There is another way to, to go through life so that, so that worry is not something that has to shackle and cripple you. So that your life is not determined by what happens to you, but rather who is walking with you. And as I thought of this, this image of counselor, as I thought of this image of guide, my mind suddenly took me back to a number of years ago when I had a experience rafting. 
Now, it wasn't rafting down the Grand River. It was whitewater rafting down the Zambezi River. And the Zambezi River begins, or the rapids begin, at the very foot of Victoria Falls. And it's about 23 stage 5 rapids. And it's, it was an incredible experience as it kind of meanders its way through Zimbabwe and, and Zambia. And there's a number of different rapids there. And I'll just share some of my personal favorites as I was reflecting on it uh, by name. They always have to name these things so accordingly, which just builds your confidence. The first one was Stairway to Heaven. I remember drinking gallons of water on that one. Um, the next one was uh, called Commercial Suicide. Um, one of my favorites was called The Devil's Toilet Bowl. Now, I could sit here and I could talk to you and I could tell you about, about this rafting on the Zambezi and what it was like and how this kind of ties into what I want to share with you this morning, but I thought it would be better to show you what rafting on the Zambezi looks like. This isn't me, but these are some other individuals that were smart enough to bring a camera with them. Let's do it. I know some of you have done some whitewater rafting, so you can appreciate some of that. Um, I kind of wanted to show you that, just like, you didn't kind of think, well, what's he talking about? Does he really, has he ever had that experience? But I appreciate the one guy kind of holding onto the rope of the boat, just refusing to let go, and then um, being completely taken over. But I remember on the very first morning when we went, we got picked up real early, and we kind of got gathered for breakfast, and the guides started to talk about what the experience was going to be like, and started to talk about the importance of listening, and kind of went through some instructions. And I'm still rubbing my eyes and thinking, let's just get into the boat. I mean, you get into the boat, you paddle, you go downstream, right? Is it okay? And then suddenly the guide said something that really caught my attention. And it was simply this. He says, every year, six to eight people die rafting the Zambezi River. Can you go back and tell me what you were just talking about? I think I might have missed a, 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 a little bit on, on all of that. And suddenly I started thinking, okay, now I realize what I'm getting myself into. And I think sometimes in the midst of life, that's where we find ourselves at when we think of our relationship with God. When, when life is going well and we think we got it under control and we think of what's going to come next is going to be okay, we, we kind of go into autopilot and think, okay, you know, you know, God, I know you're part of my life, but I'm not really listening right now. But as soon as you start to hit that first rapid, something tweaks your attention. And you say, okay, God, now, now I'm listening. What can you share into the midst of my life? And, and for maybe, for some of you here this morning, you're kind of coasting and things are going well, and perhaps it's an opportunity for us to come back and to say, okay, although things are going well for me, Lord, what, what, what can I learn from you here this day? Or for maybe for some of you, your, your attention has been caught because life has taken a turn and you, you've hit that rapid and you're saying, okay, God, I'm listening. God, I, I want to know how you can speak into my life here this day. And so as I think of that, of that description of Jesus as being our wonderful counselor, our, our guide in the midst of life, I come to this image of rafting, of what I learned that day on the Zambezi. The first lesson I learned was to put my focus on the guide. You see, the guide was, was, was great. He knew all the t techniques and he knew what to do, but it wasn't so much important as to, to focus and to memorize on exactly the words he said, but to listen so that when he said paddle forward, paddle backwards, paddle sideways, get down, pray to your God, you knew what to do. Because the natural thing to do would be to focus on the rapid ahead. And you'd suddenly block out whatever the guide was saying. And you'd be going up to this first rapid and you're thinking, oh, I should not have paid this amount of money to end my life. 
I cannot, is there an exit? Is there like a side door I can go out of? And you're going and you're focusing. And, and the guide is, is chirping in your ear, paddle, paddle, stop paddling. And suddenly you have to realize I have to take myself out of focusing, being like a deer on headlights on that which is coming towards me and to begin to listen to what the guide is speaking into my life. What does Jesus say? He says, don't worry about all those other things. Don't allow your attention to be drawn into the rapids of life. Focus on me. Listen to me. I'm not going to suddenly teleport you over the rapids, but I am going to guide you through them. You see, notice what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't just simply say, you know what, stop worrying. You know, you should stop worrying about these types of things. Because anybody knows that simply to tell someone to stop worrying about something doesn't actually help the situation. It's like like sitting me down in front of my favorite dessert, a piece of chocolate cake, and seeing the piece of chocolate cake and saying, listen, Joel, you can't eat that cake, so stop looking at the cake. Stop thinking about the cake. Stop salivating over the cake. What do you want to do? You want to eat that piece of cake because now you're told you can't do it. And a lot of times that's exactly what happens when we simply think, well, I have to stop worrying about this. I have to stop worrying about this. You start to worry more and more and more. What does Jesus say? Focus on me. Direct your attention elsewhere. I'm not telling you that the situation is going to suddenly be absorbed and suddenly dissolve. But Jesus says, I want you to put your focus on me. And what I appreciate what Jesus does is he starts at such a basic level. He's like, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about the clothing that you are going to wear. I mean, apart from air itself, can you think of anything more vitally necessary to survive as a human being? And so if Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to sort all of that out for you, He's also going to be in the midst of everything else that we experience in life. So Jesus says, focus on me. Seek the kingdom and everything else will be taken care of. The second thing I remember going down the rapid is not only to listen to my guide, but we took one rapid at a time. I mean, they tell you how many rapids are you going to go through, but you don't kind of come up to rapid four and say, okay, you know what? This rapid is really small in comparison to the rapid nine coming down the river. And you're thinking, looking at rapid four, thinking, this, this, this is small? Oh, good heavens, I don't want to get to rapid number nine. We take one rapid at a time. And that's so often the reality in life with Jesus. You notice when when, when Jesus called his followers to him, he didn't say, okay, listen, come and follow me, and I'm going to tell you what life is going to look like. I'm going to tell you your three-year, I'm going to tell you your five-year, I'm going to tell you your ten-year plan. I I don't know about you, but so often that's kind of what I want from God. I want maybe that that, that early morning email, kind of laying out what my day is going to be like. You know, what are the problems? What are some of the rapids? No, what does Jesus do? He says, come, come and and follow me. What's fascinating is on one account, on a couple of accounts, Jesus actually laid out the bigger plan to his disciples. You remember these conversations where Jesus says, listen, we have to go to Jerusalem. And we have to go to Jerusalem because I have to be handed over to the authorities. I have to suffer. I have to then die. I have to then rise on the third day. That's that's kind of the big plan. And what do the disciples do? They don't say, Jesus, thank you for the big picture plan. Now we understand it. They're like, Jesus, we don't, we don't like that plan. That's a bad plan. Choose a different plan. We need to rework that plan. I kind of think I would be like one of those disciples. You know, if, if God just kind of laid out my life plan for me and says, okay, here it is, Joel, what do you think? I'm like, I... Ah. Could you tweak that a little bit and could you just erase that part and could you make that part a little bit better? Jesus, take it one day at a time. Live life with me. And trust that as we come across different rapids in life, that we're going to go through them together. 
I included a, a quote with you from Mother Teresa, and this is actually a magnet that's on our fridge, and I, I often come across it every day. And I love these words of Mother Teresa when she says, I know God won't give me more than I can handle. I just wish he wouldn't trust me so much. Doesn't that just resonate with you? Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. At the core of Jesus teaching his disciples, what does he teach them to pray for? Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus, take care of my needs today. Give me the strength today. I appreciate the example of Mary, which was brought to light through our kids here this morning. When, when, when she was told that she would become the mother of Jesus, you would think there'd be a little bit of worry that would come along with that. And we actually th- see that there is some worry in, in terms of Mary's part because she asked a very obvious question. Well, 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 well listen, I'm, I'm not married. I'm engaged to Joseph. I, I'm still a virgin. We haven't had sex yet, so how is this going to all play out? And the angel says, don't worry, you're going to be overshadowed by the Most High and you're going to become be pregnant and everything's going to be taken care of it. We don't hear the follow-up, but I wonder if Mary says, okay, that's, that's great and all, but now I'm worrying about what that is going to play out. I mean, I mean Joseph is going to know he could, he could divorce me. Um, my, my family could disown me. Worst case scenario, because she got pregnant not by her husband, she could be stoned to death. But what does Mary do? She essentially says, I am going to trust you this day. I'm going to trust you, God, that as you are guiding me through this path in life, that you are going to guide me and that you are going to lead me. Which brings me to the third thing that I learned in the Zambezi. And that is the reality of how much time I spent going in and out of the boat. Yet in the midst of it all, my guide was always there. One of the key pieces of advice our guide told us is not if you fall out of the boat, but when you fall out of the boat and you feel like you're going deeper and deeper, and you have been abandoned, I will not leave you alone. They would come and they would gather us. It's not as if we came up to a set of rapids and the guide suddenly says, you know what, you've kind of learned enough, you've kind of figured it out, or this is a rapid that I don't really want to take, so I'm going to jump out now and walk around and I'll meet you on the other side. The guide says, I am there with you. I will not leave you. It's the very words that Jesus says to his disciples. The very promise that he gives to us in the midst of life when Jesus says, I will always be with you to the very end of this age. When the angel first approached Mary, the words out of the angel's mouth was, Mary, do not be afraid which to me resonates with the fact that there probably was some worry there. This worry of saying, okay, what's going to happen? Where is my life going to turn? What's going to take place? You know, one of the greatest commandments that is given in the Bible so often in terms of frequency is God saying, do not be afraid. Why? Because I am with you. As I think about Christmas as I think about the wonderful reality of Jesus as our wonderful counselor, the one who gives joy in the midst of all of life, I'm not going to tell you to stop worrying. What I want to encourage you is to change your focus. Whether it's big, whether it's small, whether it's ongoing or hopefully going to end soon, know that in the midst of life, Jesus is with us. Jesus will not abandon us. And Jesus is in control. By about the last rapid of the day, 
I felt like my confidence was now finally up. And I was walking around pretty proud, probably knowing that I had just gone through the last rapid so there weren't any more. But there was a part of me that was able to look back and to see all that we had accomplished. And it built confidence. And it built trust. One of the great gifts that God gives to us is the ability to remember. The ability to be able to look back in the midst of life and to see how God, perhaps in big ways, perhaps in subtle ways, has guided us and directed us. Sometimes in the moment we may not know where the strength has come. But for me, in the midst of all of life, I give thanks for the joy of knowing that God is there with me. And my prayer, for, my prayer for you, as it is for me, is that we would continue to focus upon Jesus, our wonderful counselor, the one who guides us, the one who directs us, in the midst of all of life. Please stand with me as we sing together.